Economics is the social science that deals with the allocation of scarce resources among alternative uses to attain desired ends. And the central element in the analysis is the assumption that the most efficient method of allocation would be through market forces. However, the market model assumes the ready availability of resources. And if there's a social space where there is a natural scarcity, that would be the urban areas. Space is restricted in towns and cities. And what makes it specially scarce is summarized in the three popular words among real estate developers. Location, location, location. Market-based decisions can well result in a socially undesirable outcome. Cities are multifunctional. They are places of work, places of residence, centers of employment with offices and commercial centers, places for leisure and amenities, places to obtain health care and education, centers for tourism and pilgrimage. All these various activities are located in tangible buildings and structures, which require space, in addition to the space necessary to locate the vital infrastructure that makes cities run and create the modern lifestyle we are accustomed to, the transport, communications, energy, water supply, and sanitation systems. Most of the large cities also happen to be quite ancient so that they also are location of old buildings, even whole districts, that define the city's history and even distinctive architecture and urban design before the emergence of modernism and the globally standardized building design in architecture and engineering. Beautiful and well-run cities are therefore those with a centralized government focused on urban planning and management. Decisions have to be made on how to allocate space for the various activities that people engage in when in the cities. Paris, for example, has zoned its 19th century city center for the old buildings that were constructed in the 1850s and 60s, following the design guidelines set by Baron Ausmann and buildings constructed since then, with the notable exception of the Eiffel Tower and Tour Montparnasse, had to conform to the same building heights, so that a certain harmony in architectural design creates a distinctive image for the city. But space has also been allocated for the transport system by way of the wide boulevards and city streets and the underground for an efficient subway network that allows for fast and efficient movement of peoples, not just throughout the city, but towards the nearby suburban areas. And wide sidewalks have also been reserved for pedestrians. The construction of tall modernist skyscrapers were all assigned to areas outside the city center, notably at La Défense. In the same way, Zoning restrictions have identified blocks in the borough of Manhattan where towering skyscrapers could be located. But also districts have been identified with lower building heights and design restrictions to identify and preserve the heritage districts of the city of New York. Space has been set aside for pedestrian curbs and walkways and the urban transit system that used to be constructed above ground has been relocated underground alongside the electric power and telecommunications cables that have made the vistas of the city readily available for anyone who would care to notice and behold. Massive aqueducts have been constructed towards deep inside the city to deliver more fresh water to the city for the next 50 years or so. And the entire street system has been designed as a grid since 1811 to allow for greater mobility for both people and vehicles throughout the entire city. In the absence of a centralized urban management system, then, as in neoclassical economic analysis, market forces take over. The main issue with market forces is that they tend to favor those with purchasing power, 
which is especially problematic when incomes are inequitably distributed and when the mass of the population possess little financial demand. This would mean that space, already quite scarce in the city, will be by and large privatized for the use of those with substantial incomes who tend to prefer each other's company and to distance themselves from those outside their income class. Consider the vehicular traffic situation in Metro Manila, specifically the Makati area. Notice how large areas are not accessible to the general public, either as pedestrians or in their vehicles. The private residential villages have restricted any ingress and egress to their neighborhood. In the commercial districts of Legaspi and Salcedo villages and Ayala Center, the streets are not gridded but actually circulate within their confines. As a result, all these products of private real estate development have resulted in massive traffic jams in the EDSA segment from Guadalupe to Eslex. EDSA is the main transport artery of the metropolis. But in the Makati area, in addition to all the vehicles that have to pass through EDSA, one would see all those that need to go from Ayala Center to, say, Rockwell. Because there's only one other alternative route, which is the equally traffic log Makati Avenue, Kalayan Avenue route. A street that directly connects the Ayala Center to Rockwell could easily be designed and developed but this has been supplanted by the market logic of private real estate development. Moreover, the entire Urdaneta village, Bel Air, San Lorenzo, Forbes Park, Dasmarinas villages are all occupied by two-story residential structures occupying substantial lots in contrast to the San Sebastian area. Okay? These have in a sense provided the premier business district with a forested area, much like Central Park in New York. Unfortunately, these wooded areas are private and not accessible to the general public. They do have rules that the residents have to follow with regard to the height of their homes and the ratio of the built structure to the open space of their lots. Moreover, from an urban management point of view, all the land in these villages can be utilized for the construction of high-rise multiple-unit residential buildings, much like in Singapore, to contrast it with the city up above. There is space enough for the construction of luxury residential units, such that units for the middle income can be constructed as well. The district can be designed around public parks, with space for social services, such as schools, hospitals, and the like and many who now commute long distances can now live nearer their places of work in the Makati Central Business District. This will then reduce traffic volumes on the streets of the city because more people can then just walk or take a short public transit commute from their residence to place of work and shopping and back. This has been the logic behind many of the more recent upscale real estate development in the BGC, Ortigas, and Eastwood areas, which unfortunately do not provide for middle-income housing since, again, the market logic dominates, and high-rise condominium developments are designed largely for the upper income, either as residents, but also usually as investment for rental or resale. If one therefore talks about inclusive development, the market-based solutions do not at all realize this. And a lot of scarce urban space is reserved for those who can afford the space within the city so that those with more modest incomes have little choice but to locate far from the city centers. But this would then require that they have access to transport options which would allow them to work in the city centers yet live far away in the suburbs and peripheries of the city. They would purchase their, their own vehicle if they could afford it or rely on mass transit options. Either way, the result would be the massive traffic jams as all the vehicles 
whether privately owned or mass transit, would be using the same scarce road space. If a lot of the roads in the Makati area are not accessible, it is actually true of most areas in the city, so that actually the road space available is extremely limited. Moreover, to encourage people to shift to mass transit ignores the fact that this would mean roads need to be narrowed to allow for more space for the sidewalks and pedestrian curbs, as mass transit commuters are also naturally pedestrians. There would also be the need for space for intermodal transfers, such as space near the train stations. For the utility vehicles and jeeps that can then transport the commuters to their varying destinations. Nothing so underscored this as when the quarantine was first implemented last 15th March 2020. Access across cities and towns in the country were restricted, but the essential workers were supposed to continue their work, especially the medical and health professionals. There were massive traffic jams at places like Marcos Highway, at the boundary of the NCR with Cainta. As these were largely jeeps and utility vehicles with the essential workers riding to their places of work. Indeed, the policy, laudable in its intent to contain the spread of the coronavirus too, ignored the fact that the essential workers, such as the nurses and lab technicians in hospitals, such as those in BGC, Makati, Green Hills that cater to the well healed that live within NCR, the essential workers can only afford to live outside the NCR. As a starting point, therefore, for inclusive development, Central urban management has to be implemented in the NCR and the surrounding towns and cities, as these comprise a single urban region. Some decisions have to be made to allocate space even for just one important area, like urban transport. The mass transit designs have to cover not just Metro Manila, but the surrounding towns and cities, as many who live there, work daily within NCR, so that the entire region has to be seen as one functioning economic region. This will provide those with more modest incomes regular access to the jobs in the business districts. The transport decision would cover if underground and above ground transport are to be expanded space for pedestrians and for intermodal transfers, and the location and design of roads, including whether electric and telecom cables have to be above ground or underground. This would be a starting point for a more inclusive city. In the absence of rezoning to allow for more affordable housing options in the city centers, but that would be another kettle of fish. Thank you.